He'd listen, those people would listen to that man. But when this man essentially comes in and says, what? Remember that? That's, what did that man in the back there say? Can't give a nigga that much power. So, we have the individualist and the collectivist mentality that scares the hell out of him. Okay? So, what happens if we have a combination of the two? What happens if the great ones amongst us is for the collective? Oh, then you got a whole other kind of animal. Hmm. Okay? What happens if we have a movement that is seriously collectivized around someone who loves his and her people? Okay? Now, of course, we don't know who to say Muhammad Ali is. A lot of us don't do that because we, don't, we haven't gone that far back in there. Okay, so let's, I want to introduce you to this man who was one of the first pan Africanists out there. The pan Africanist playwright and an, uh, an actor who produced original plays while studying journalism and politics in 1909. He began to work as a journalist publishing articles. An influential London-based literary journal in 1912 with the help of West Africans who supported the his, his sociopolitical views, he created the African Times and Orient Review. The publication was the first black-owned tabloid in England and focused on political issues in the United States, the Caribbean, West Africa, South Africa, and Egypt. W.E.D. Du Bois, Edward Bladen, uh, Bladen, I'm sorry, Edward Bladen, Martin Delaney, and other prominent Pan-Africanists also contributed to it. Two years later, he published a short story of Egypt titled In the Land of the Pharaohs, which was said to have been the first history of Egypt written by an Egyptian. Okay? The book received huge acclaim and launched Ali into international Pan-African prominence. A young Marcus Garvey who befriended him while studying in London was also attracted to the political focus of the African Times and Orient Review. And the two worked together writing articles about English colonialism. The British government finally shut it down in 1918 around the time of World War I, prohibiting its distribution to India and Africa for fears that its content would incite revolution. However, in 1920, Ali restarted the paper and renamed it the African and Orient Review. That's what it looked like. Okay? Now. Okay. Where we are? Regarding uh, uh, Ali serving as a mentor to Marcus Garvey, a lot of people say, well, he was not a Mar uh, 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 Marcus Garvey did not um, mentor with uh, Dusay Muhammad. Well, that's a kind of a gray area there, because regarding the self, him serving as a mentor, Garvey's staunch nationalistic and pan-Africanist views were birthed in Jamaica under the tutelage of a Bahamian-born U.S. trained physician named Robert Love, okay, who had settled in Jamaica. Love's newspaper was called the Jamaica Advocate, which promoted race-first consciousness and anti-colonialism while advocating land reform and black representation in legislative council. Most importantly, it, was carried, it also carried news of the black world outside the boundaries of Jamaica. Garvey joined and eventually became secretary of the National Club, which formed in 1909 with a mandate for self-governance in Jamaica within the empire. The club was short-lived, however, ending its run in 1910, along with Garvey's own newspaper, The Watchman. There's a white, group, a white man who's got his name now. He's taken over that name, and he's dealing with race first, clan issues. He's, he's part of the clan, and his name is called The Watchman. It's in my book, The Wounded Womb. Garvey then moved to London in 1912, where he went to school and sought out Dusway Muhammad Ali, whom he had heard about through his works. Thus, Garvey's pan-Africanist strategies and worldview were not started in London, but more accurately honed and internationally sophisticated by the association with Duse Mohammed, based on Mohammed's own personal closer proximity to British, the British global politics in Egypt. So it, he was honed there. 
He did not have the sophistication that the Duce had, having traveled across, back and forth the continent, and where he had, he'd known the African uh, 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 politics at that particular level, a personal level. So Muhammad journeyed to the United States to promote his vision of economic pan-Africanism by settling up a commercial link between West Africans and diasporic Africans, where he briefly worked in Garvey's United or Universal Negro Improvement Association movement as head of the Department of African Affairs, as well as contribute articles on African issues to the Negro world. In the 1920s, during his capacity as head of the Department of African Affairs, he went up against the major British Jewish farm produce firms like the Lever Brothers by repeatedly but unsuccessfully attempting to secure U.S. African financing that would enable West African produce farmers to secure markets and exports to the United States. Up until the 1930s, he even failed to gain Euro-American capital for the same purpose. In 1931, Ali left permanently for West Africa, settling in Lagos, Nigeria, where he re-established his initial love of journalism, becoming founder and editor of The Comet, which in 1933 became Nigeria's largest weekly publication. In 1934, he serialized his novel, uh, Ere Roosevelt Came, or Before Roosevelt Came, which, among other things, touched upon his experiences with the African struggle in the United States. He traveled and forged relationships throughout Africa, retired from managing his newspaper in 1943, and eventually passed away in Lagos two years later on February 26, 1945, at the age of 78. That man most of us don't know anything about and his influence. And of course, another man, founder of the Morris Science Temple, of America in Newark, New Jersey, 1913, the very year that they had a crash, when he got his uh, referendum at the meeting in Cuba. Right after that, the Secretary of State went back and there was a market crash. He had his own foundation, even had senators and congressmen and aldermen coming to visit with him at his temple. He had a lot of energy going, a lot of people came around him. Again, evidence of an individualist serving and working for the collective. You can be individual, you can be leadership, you can go and say, well, that's wrong. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to make it, I'm going to show them how to do it right. That's what real individualists who have purpose do. And of course, One of the men that I know is um, one of the greatest men that I have ever read about, thought about. A man who have come across all of the challenges he did. Only the British Empire brought him down. It wasn't the Americans. Because the British said, you do not have a science in place sophisticated enough to deal with that man. So they brought in the British who were running the, um, the United States at that time from the uh, Ten Mile Enclave. And it was the British in conjunction with the American um, uh, Congress who conspired with the tax uh, laws to bring down Garvey or to chase Garvey. And of course you saw what he did. Here you have an individualist who saw the vision, wanted to work for his people and did it. And these people came together. He was so successful, he even had stock. Stock. You could buy stock in the Black Star Alliance. They were setting up international trade, so the Jew knew what to do in order to circumvent that collectivist mentality. They helped to fund and create what became known as the Civil Rights Movement. Hmm. That thing about her sitting on the bus and not getting up and kick-starting the civil rights, nah, it was a plan. Why do you think they got all that airplay? The Jews ran. They ran everything. They knew that the black uh, um, adults um, in, uh, in uh, Oklahoma, the black Wall Street, they saw our self-sufficiency as a threat. So integration had to be one of the weapons they used. You had to come and feel that white privilege now was opening its arms to you. You could drink at their nasty fountains. 
oh my God, let's hurry up over. Jesus is now freed us. Frying pan into the fire. See, every one of us who are collectivists who came together to say we could do for ourselves showed how it could be done. Now, this is another story here. Wallace Fard Muhammad, formerly known as David Fordell, in the Morris Science Temple of America, founded the Nation of Islam on July 4th, 1930, in Detroit, Michigan. When Master Fard suddenly disappeared in June of 1934, the Nation of Islam came under the leadership of Elijah Muhammad, who was introduced to Master Fard by his beloved wife, Mother Claire Muhammad. Muhammad went on to establish temples, businesses, farms, real estate holdings in the United States and abroad, and a school named Muhammad University of Islam. This is not about the religion. It's about the fact that you can collectively put black power together under whatever mantle. But because we don't have a centralizing theme anymore, we once did. We almost did, because here we have all the people that actually showed you that they were coming out to listen. That's dangerous. That man is dangerous to them. You're getting the people, you're getting the field niggas to start thinking, wait a minute. You start getting that, that Turner mentality. We can have that. So this, this whole situation had to be changed. And when that began to die down and, and they began to become a little bit more conservative over in the nation, this came up. The original six were the members of the Black Panther Party. At the top left, of course, you see Big Man Howard, Huey Newton, Sherwin Fort, Bobby Seale, Reggie Fort, and little Bobby Hutton, who's the treasurer. One they killed. So you see, all of us, individualists, acting on behalf of the countries and the sisters. Come on. See, these were the sisters now. There was no nonsense. These are empresses. Because they understood and understood. All right? They knew. This is what they looked like. I want you to see what the Black Panther women and the women of these particular groups looked and carried themselves like. Understand and understand that they were modest. They understood what it was to have an appearance of what it's supposed to look like. But let me let you see this, and you have to understand this, that these sisters, what they went through, the blood, sweat, and tears that they shed, all of the hurt and the pain they went through to see their brothers incarcerated, dying on the streets, they did not do all of that when they came together to see and to, and, and to, and to show their strength and to teach their young, the, young, the young girls what it was about to come together as a collective. All of this that they did was not to show this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is not paying homage. It's using a theme because you wanted to make a statement in your own ignorant way. You do not do homage to our sisters doing this. And I'll be damned if I've ever saw a sister who was Black Panther blonde. <laughs> what the hell was she saying? You do not represent our sisters like this. <laughs> Nor do you represent our sisters for damn sure like this. I was insulted. I don't know. I mean, oh man, you see Beyonce did it. She did. Oh man, she came out. She made the statement. Are you kidding me? Have you lost your mind? That shows how ignorant you are. None of the sisters that they're supposed to be emulating ever spread their legs and had their crotch open in front of 10, 20 million people. Okay, I'm a prude. I'm a prude, okay? I'd love to see my sisters garbed out. Only time I'd like to see my sister naked is when I'm with her. One on one. Because this is ridiculous. I understand the fact that in Africa we gave extolling to the male and female parts, but we did it in reverence. 
not to entertain anybody. And even when our sisters danced, they danced the dance of fertility, they were still clothed. Fully. And we men had to imagine. Because see, we men are visual. And when once we see it, then it's what? So what? Yeah. When we don't see it, and it looks so beautiful, and we're like, okay, that's a nice package, and it's wrapped so nicely for me. <laughs> Just pull at the ribbons here, and pull at the bow there, and so forth. <laughs> Ridiculous. See, these brothers had a purpose. What was the purpose? The purpose was, essentially, to bring everybody together, to show what uniformity was about, and not to be taking any crap from anybody and showing it. See, we can't do this today. White boys can get on there and start walking around with their M80s and M30s, whatever the names of these guns that they have. They got all kinds of weaponry now. They can walk around talking about my rights. White policemen walk up to them very gingerly, you know, um, uh, can we see your rights? No, I'm doing my own rights and so forth. Get a black man coming up to the streets walking around with an M16 on his back or M18 on his back. And the beauty of it is that we did not just have, we took care of our own. When individualists served the collective, when individualists served the collective, even they would want to participate. Marlon Brando used to come in and drop money into the, uh, into the coffers, a secret place. A friend of mine was an actor. His name is uh, Nathan George. Uh, he played in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, the black dude that beat the hell out of um, a very close friend of mine. He said that uh, Sammy Davis Jr. used to drop $50,000 a piece at a park down in the basement. He used to, every time he'd come into New York, he would meet up with the Panthers and drop 50 k on them. See, I don't see that from the rappers today. They may be putting it into things that are tax shelters and, and those dole out to us. No. Want to know what the nightmare of the white supremacist is? Want to know what it looks like? Here's what it looks like. This shit scares, excuse me, the hell out of white people. <laughs> they all come in packs and with their guns, but you would never ever see them walk up in anybody like this. They'll bomb you from the air. That's why no warfare changed. It changed into this, you know, this is a special ops. We sneak up and kill you in your bed. That makes us special. One to one, they could never do it. No great white hope. They could never defeat an army like that. The only way they can do it is with superior weaponry, of course. And that's what they do. They sit in labs and learn how to get to kill you better and more efficiently. They bomb you from 50,000 uh, feet. They never fit, they would never say, oh, too much casualties. We won't sacrifice that many men. Yet still, when they do that type of war over there in, in Iraq, there's more suicides now than ever for their soldiers. So what they, whoever they kill, nature gets them to kill themselves. When they come back with those injections, the children are being deformed. It's all a plan. There's another nightmare from white supremacists. It scares the hell out of them when they look at these brothers, when they came together to defend Muhammad Ali. Look at these brothers. Hmm? You see LeBron anywhere? <laughs> You think you even join one of these? Even Steph and them. Today they're not conscious, they're all individualists. They don't see each other. They don't come together for a damn thing. In fact, it may be even in their contracts. 